Thanks everyone for joining um, the eighth Women in Live Music Weekly webinar. It's been a, a wild ride um, and we're kind of coming to the end now. We've only got a few left um, because I guess people are sort of going back to work and stuff and you know, hopefully that'll be me at some point, but I'm um, not counting on it. But um, yeah, for those who don't know who uh, we are, Women in Live Music is a nonprofit organization that was founded in 2018. Uh, because currently women only make up a very small percentage of the music industry, between about 5 and 10%. Uh, we believe that the music industry is a place for everyone and we support diversity. So um, we started this organisation to kind of grow a positive community where we can share our knowledge, skills, uh, job opportunities to try and equalise the gender balance in the years to come. Um, despite being called Women in Live Music, we don't exclude anyone from attending our workshops or uh, these webinars. So yeah, everyone is welcome. Um, today, uh, if you've got any questions, which I hope you have, please type them in the chat and um, we will go through them at the end. Um, I am now going to introduce Olga, who is a production uh, coordinator for John Fogarty's Sabaton. And she also does uh, a myriad of other roles, like uh, merchandise managing for the Rasmus and the Scorpions and Amaranth and many more. Um, and we're super excited to have her here today to talk to you all about production management. Sorry, production coordination. So um, before we get started with your presentation, Olga, can you just give us a little bit uh, about um, your story, how you sort of came to where you are today? Yeah, totally. Um, I'm super happy to be here. I'm very excited to talk about the thing that I love doing so much, which is work. Um, I've kind of, I fell in love, in love with live music when I was 14, when I went to my first show. It's like, it's the classical thing. You go to a gig and you, I saw the stage and I was like, I want this every single day of my life. Funny enough, that was a show for the Rasmus, which was my first show, who I got to tour with last year and do merch for them, which was really cool because that kind of, you know, came, it came full circle a bit. Um, yeah, I got into touring um, through doing merch. I've always kind of wanted to be more, when I was a kid, I really wanted to be a TM. I didn't really understand what a TM does. Now that I understand it, I'm not that keen on doing it, if I'm honest. But, you know, um, uh, that was just kind of what I wanted to do. And I, I always really struggled finding my way in. I don't know if the options that are available now weren't available when I graduated about 10 years ago. Or I just didn't know about it. Like, I knew there were some schools, but I, it was never really a good option there for what I wanted to do. So I've always, I've always gone to loads of shows. I've always been very, very involved with music anyway because I loved it so much and I've always been really well connected with the people that were on stage and behind the scenes like I've always hung out with loads and loads of roadies and I've always felt very at home there and at some point you know a friend of mine couldn't do a tour and he put me forward that was about four and a half years ago I think and uh, I went out and I did Merch for Crossface supporting Skin Dread, who I love dearly, because they're so amazing. And it was really like, I was so freaked out. I remember my first day on a real, like on a really big tour. Like I did a lot of DIY stuff. I did, I, I was in the US for six months doing DIY touring. Um, but this was proper, like a real, a real tour with a really big band who I loved, who I just watched play. And the first day, like everybody assumed that I wasn't part of the tour. Everybody thought I was just working at the venue and I was local because I was a girl. Let's just say it. <laughs> and the only person that, like, not the, like, a lot of people were nice when I introduced myself, it was fine. But the singer of Skinner was actually headed out the, out the venue to do an interview. And he sees me, you know, unpacking merch and prepping shit. And he turns around and he walks back to me and he introduces himself to me. And he was like, oh, welcome to the tour. And I was like, oh, this is awesome. This is actually someone who like, doesn't assume that I'm a local. Benji is the coolest. <laughs> I, love I love him so much. Um, 
but yeah, that was really cool. And then, you know, I, I did some really low level touring and I kind of got, I got, I got super lucky in my career that I, you know, I did local merch selling for the right people and I got to um, work for a really big company very early in my career. I think it took, it was about maybe two years into touring, I think less than that. But I did my first gigs for Global Merchandise, who are one of the biggest merchandise company based out of London. I think I'm the only, I am the only, I think I'm the only like proper female touring staff they have. They have, I know they have one other person that does it every now and then, but I'm like the only one that does it regularly. And I was like the only person on their staff that was under 30 when I started. So it was pretty, pretty crazy that I even got that opportunity. And I got to work with some really big bands. And um, like everybody who does merch knows that once you get to the, the really big ones, when it, once you do arenas, it's kind of boring because it's all concessions. Like I did Gods of Rap last year and um, it was all concessions and I was, like, I was doing the event merchandise, so it wasn't very busy. And um, it was this really weird tour that got planned quite, kind of last minute, super hectic setup. Um, the production was amazing. We had, we, we had Public Enemy and the Wu-Tang Clan, which people don't expect to have a huge production, but they did. And it was super cool. And um, our production assistant on the tour couldn't do all the dates. And especially towards the end, he, um, he works for Ed Sheeran, so he had to leave and uh, prep the Ed Sheeran tour. So he was gone. And I want to say someone else left as well. So our poor PM um, on the tour was kind of left alone. He had like someone else fly in to assist him, but he was all by himself. So I was like, all right, let me help you any way I can. I have nothing to do anyway. So I ran around and, you know, I put up dressing room signs and I help with guest lists because that was quite interesting with, um, you know, artists that are not that used to schedules and when there's like nine people in the band and you have several bands, it's a little bit crazy, but um, I started doing that and I've always done that a little bit on other tours anyway. Like I've always been involved with, um, kind of assistant, assistant TMing, I guess, for Devil Driver I've been for, with for four years now. And with every band, I always feel like if I can help, I'm always happy to help if I, if I have the time. I used to offer it to TMs a lot. Now it just kind of comes naturally. Like if, if they want it, a lot of people don't. Um, and kind of slowly that's grown into me feeling more secure in what I do and feeling like I actually know what production is a little bit about, what TMing is a little bit about. And then last year, I think I'm like the only person I know that actually has gotten a job off Bobnet. Uh, everybody else, everybody else I know is like, oh, if I got a dollar for every job I got off Bobnet, I would have zero dollars. <laughs> um, well, I'm one of those people. I got my first production coordinator gig off Bobnet and I wasn't even a member. I was literally, we were at download last year and I was sitting next to my friend and she got an email from Bobnet looking for a European based production coordinator. And I was like, oh, send me that. I'll, I'll send you an email and you're not supposed to share Bobnet information. And I have since signed up and I will never cancel my membership just, you know, out of respect for the whole thing. Um, but that gave me my first gig and I, like I still, some, sometimes I ask my PM that hired me on it. I'm like, why did you pick me? Like you had people applying that had more experience. And I told him I've never done this as a proper job before. And he was like, I just had a good feeling about you. And he like gave people my CV and they approved it. Like people that he knows. And he's, he's a really experienced uh, PM. And he said to me that um, the three best production coordinators that he knows all come from a merge background. So I guess there's a lot of things that intertwine and made me, it made me learn a lot. And the first day I was like, what if I show up and I don't know what to do? 
and I just sit at my desk and I'm like, what am I supposed to do? But it just came so naturally. And I just, I guess something just clicked in and I just love it. I just love it. You're like the mom of the tour and you get to take care of everybody and you get to make everybody smile. And it's my favorite thing. Like I, I still do merch and I love doing merch sometimes as well. But um, I think production, assisting, coordinating, whatever, some people call it different terms. Some people consider it kind of the same. I don't, but I'll get into that more later. But I, I really love the job and I really appreciate it. Wow, thank you for, for giving us your story. I can't believe you got your first uh, gig off BobNet for <laughs> being a production assistant. That's, that's just amazing. Yeah. But I mean, it's great as well that um, you can get, I guess, so much from merch, like your merch background helped you where you are today, because that wouldn't be something that I would think of that would come naturally kind of moving from merch into production, because I always thought, of, I don't know, I guess you need to know, you maybe you need to be technical, but it's not true, is it? No. You just need to be good with people and organization and, and all these things that I, I guess you are. Well, I think one of the biggest part is also that you're sitting in the production office a lot. Like when you're mm. a merchandise manager, a lot of times you're doing your numbers and you're doing your cash. And I always, if I have a chance to have some privacy, I don't want to do it in a crew room because you're dealing with money and you don't want to deal with money in front of people. Um, so I'm in the production office quite a bit. And I'm, I don't know, I'm just the kind of person that always has my ears everywhere. So I'm kind of trying to pick up on stuff, not stuff I'm not supposed to know about, but um, I'm just trying to look at what's, what's happening around me and I always have. And um, I think that's probably one of the biggest parallels. And then when you do merch, you manage money, you manage accounting, you manage people. So it sounds, it sounds like it's opposites, but it's really, they're actually really close jobs. And I think one of the other things, especially being European based is, when you do merch, you don't really spend a lot of time with the band because we, we always kind of get hired for the European run. And then um, on the other leg, there's someone else doing it or like you can stay with the band for a longer period of time, but you always do just a month, maybe a month and a half. Um, I was talking to a, a colleague of mine who's uh, a, an A-level guitar tech and he's probably worked like seven, eight bands. In his career in his career and i've worked for like 40 or something i don't know but it's a much much bigger number because i switch around so much and you you a you develop people skills you just have to because you're always the new kid you're always the new one to the party and i think that really helps and also you just meet way more people you just meet so many people so you know when that band like, for example, the, um, the production coordinator for Parkway Drive, Tanner, she used to um, do their merch. And then she kind of slowly got roped into doing their production as well as they grew bigger. And that, I think it works like that a lot of times. Great. Okay. Do you want to tell us all about uh, your job then as a production coordinator? I would love to. Great. Let's see if... Um, me sharing the presentation is going to work. Can you see it? Yeah, that looks fine, yeah. Awesome. All right, let's get into it. All right, so what is a production coordinator? Um, on the organizational side of a tour, there's usually a TM and a PM, a TM taking care of the band and the PM taking care of the production. Now a production coordinator, and that's how it's kind of differs a little bit from a production system. The production system usually assists the PM. The production coordinator assists the PM and the TM at the same time. And it, it can be very different depending on um, the tour you're on. It just depends on how the tour is structured. I kind of like to put it as the TM takes care of the band's needs, the PM takes care of what's happening on stage and that everything that involves around what's going to happen during the show on stage happens. 
and the production coordinator takes care of everything else. So the, the crew, what's happening backstage, everything kind of that involves around it. Um, I'll explain a little bit more how it differs on the tour structure a little bit because I happen to work for two tours that could probably not be much more different in how they're structured. Um, to just give you a quick overview on how a tour is structured, just in case you haven't really toured arenas and you're not that familiar with that, um, here's an overview of how a tour is kind of built generally. Now, these jobs are very subject, some of these jobs are so subject to what tour you're on, like automation is a department that um, usually is you, you can probably find it more on like the big pop tours. Um, VIP is super popular, but also not everybody wants to do it. But just to give you an idea of how a tour is organized a little bit, um, you kind of always have, you have the PM, then you have the production coordinator and the stage manager as uh, his left and right hand. And then you have the different departments and most departments have um, a, di a director or a head of the department. And then uh, if there's hired crew, like for example, when you hire a lighting crew, then you'll have, I don't know, four people on lights and you'll have a crew chief for those people as well. So you'll have the LD who is the lighting designer, you'll have the crew chief and then the crew chief organizes his staff. Um, just to give you a little bit of an overview, I, uh, try to make uh, one of those trays, but uh, then I just rather stole a little bit from the tour management 101 webinar series, who I think stole it from someone else. Really, really great webinar, I can highly recommend. Uh, so um, let me introduce you to how these tours can be differently built. So one of my main clients is John Fogarty, who I was supposed to be on tour with right now. <laughs> um, with John, it's quite the unique situation also because of who he is and how much of a rock star he is and um, just his status really. Um, with John, we have about 60 people in our traveling party. We had, well, this is on the last tour, obviously not this one, that is not happening. Uh, we had six trucks, three buses, and a jet. So our principal artist, which is our A party, um, was six people traveling on a private jet. Um, that sounds super fun, but it always comes with really interesting challenges because um, obviously there's um, you have to kind of have a private airport somewhere that, that the artist can fly into. Um, we had an issue last year. We were doing a show at a beautiful venue in Sweden and um, our artists had gone to Paris for a day off. I think we, had, I think we actually had two days off. They, they went to Paris and they were supposed to fly in on show day, which we always do and it's fine. But um, turns out that France has different laws on how old a pilot can be. So our artist was about to leave and then they told him, uh, your pilot can't fly you because he's too old. So they had, the charter company had to find a different pilot. And we were sitting at the venue, just kind of like, is this going to happen? Kind of like a little bit stressing, a little bit, you know, if there's nothing that you can do at that point. So you just wait and see and everything went fine. But, um, yeah, that's the challenges you have when you have an artist traveling on the jet for sure. Um, so on John Forgery, we also have a B party, which is band and dancers uh, and singers of nine people. And then we have a C party of 27, which is crew. Um, additionally to that, of course, you have the drivers for the trucks and buses that we can't forget about. And when you have double drivers, it adds up to a total of 18 people. Um, that you don't always have on, but that's like the maximum amount of people that you have on your tour. Um, so the tr structure we had on that tour was a TM, a PM, and a production coordinator. The TM on this tour took care of everything, travel, um, 
besides the hotels the hotels were booked by the tm but then all of the advancing and all the checking in and all the dealing with the travel agents was uh done by the pm and me as a production coordinator so there's always like there's always different dynamics uh on on these kind of tours then we had a stage manager a head rigger and then you know the, the standard things that you have on even a small club tour we had a front of house guy one other guy that we had our backline merge then we had quite a bit of um ld action and video action going so we had six people each on that and we had two audio techs and two special effects um on our crew out of the 27 people that we had in our crew plus the 18 drivers we had two females which was me and we had a female camera operator just to give you a little bit of background on um how the roles are on a tour like that uh, we also had a female dancer and one female dancer and two singers that were also female so there was a little bit of a uh, women power going on there so this is how it was structured on the john porgerty tour that we did last summer now now i'm going to show you what we had on sabaton in january which is kind of not also very non-standard so we had a traveling party of 125 people which is quite large um we had seven trucks and seven buses two of the buses were support buses um we don't have a split of like a principal and band seeing as our our artist is the band so our a party was five people and then our c party which is the crew was 41 and then we carried our own stagehands um it's not very common to do that but it's it's genius um having your own stagehands gives you so much more ability of being flexible time wise like we did I think I think our show in London was the 8th of February so it was like a week after the Brexit due date so we had no idea how the border was going to be like and we played Paris the night before then we had to go straight to London and then straight to Am Amsterdam the day after um that's cutting it close that's quite some drives especially when you finish load out late and um we were a little bit nervous about that, but everything worked out fine. And one of the reasons it worked out fine was because we had our own stagehands and we were done. Um, I think our loadout at Wembley Arena in London took 55 minutes for six trucks. And that's just mind blowing. Like um, the local promoters were all in shock that it worked so fast. And it's because there's a learning curve. Of course, when you take down the same show and you put up the same show, multiple amount of times then you just you know what you're doing and you get used to it and you get your little tricks so um it's a really really cool thing to have and also actually makes sense a lot um cost wise because stagehands are so expensive i think one of the top rates that rates i've seen is about 60 euros an hour or something and then you have to obviously have more than 29 if you book them because uh, these 29 are used to our production. If you book, you know, stations show to show, you book more like 60, 70, 80 or something like that. Um, yeah, so then we had um, two support bands on the tour and a total of 28 amazing drivers um, at the peak times. Um, with the double drives and everything. Um, when we when when you don't need double drivers, a lot of times when you do shorter drives, they fly in and out. But you have to make sure that you keep up with driving hours that are quite um, complicated in Europe. There's 45 hour breaks and 24 hour breaks that you need to be aware of. Um, so a lot of times you have double drivers to um, deal with the driving hours and the breaks. So on this tour, we have also a TM, a PM, and a production coordinator. And then we have a stage manager, an accountant, a head rigger, a wardrobe person. We have a physio, which is amazing luxury. Um, we have a videographer. We, then we had a front of house guy, monitor, backline. We had two set carpenters, which is the people that set up everything on, st on stage. We had three people emerge in that tour. And we had a PR manager who was also absolutely amazing. 
Um, usually, you guys are probably used to this, that photographers get three songs at the beginning of a set, and that's it. Um, for our shows, they got five songs. They also got a guideline on where there are special effects, where there's pyro or explosions going on or whatever. We have quite a bit of um, Big Better Bang going on on stage with Sabaton. And um, the songs were spread out and the photographers were put in groups. So um, um, we, our, our media manager, our PR manager, he was taking care of the photographers and he was also taking care of all interviews and all press, which was amazing. And I think our photographers were all very, very, very happy with the opportunities they got to shoot the show. And it's great for our band too, because then they get good exposure. So it's, you know, if everybody works together, it works out really well. And then again, we had um, a lighting team, we had a video team, we had four audio tags to take care of our PA, and we had two people on special effects. Now on this tour, we were carrying catering as well. So we had eight people on catering, additionally, um, that were on our traveling party. Now, this crew, again, it's 41 people, plus there were 12 people in the support people's, in the support band's crew, and we had 28 drivers and out of, out of these 28, uh, out of the, all these people, we had five females on the tour, uh, which was the lead truck driver, Jessica, who's amazing. Um, then we had a uh, person on wardrobe. We had our headset partner is also a wonderful lady. She's an absolute badass. And we had a female audio tag as well, um, plus me. And later in the tour, we had um, Apocalyptica had their merch person replaced by Kaylee is also in Wilm. So then we actually had six um, females on crew and there is five in catering, which is quite common, I guess. There's always a lot of females in catering staff. Um, so um, for example, because I had catering on, on Sabaton, I did not have to deal with advancing catering. Whereas on John Forgery, where we are not carrying catering, I have to advance our hospitality riders, which is quite a few pages long. And I have to advance that with every single venue and every single festival we're playing. And it's a lot of back and forth. I'll show you a little bit about that later as well. Um, but that's just part of, you know, something that is part of my job when I don't have this. Same, we have a water person with us, uh, with Sabaton, that takes care of the band's dressing room needs and everything. On John Fogarty, I'm the one doing that. Um, I'm the one setting up the dressing rooms, you know, t checking that everything is there that is on our hospitality rider, which is quite extensive. Um, for example, we need an iron ironing board and we are, we're carrying our own iron now just because it's easier and then we have a decent one um because john's wife likes to iron his shirts before the show which i think is the sweetest thing in the world but it's just their tradition so that's a really important thing that needs to be set up and they have like a special green juice that they drink and um they're used to doing a lot of stuff the way they do it in the u.s because in the U.S. they just send out someone to buy ju this juice from a juice store. We were playing the most random places that don't even have a dry cleaner. So I would have to make sure the catering does it. Or they just provide me with a blender and I would make the juices myself. I would like, I, I don't care. I'll just put it together. <laughs> as long as the art is happy, that's, that's all I want. Um, and then there's like, there's also different varieties of how the show is handled itself like for example with John Fogarty they come in just before the show because if they fly in on the jet they probably check in their hotel or not depending on where you are and where they're going um but they, the the a party comes in just before the show do the show get off stage they go straight into a van off the stage and then they do what's called doing a runner um so I had to make sure that I put all of the stuff that they came with back into the van so they can leave right away after they come off stage. So you avoid the traffic of the fans leaving the show as well. Uh, with Sabaton, complete opposite. We had the band traveling with us at all times. Um, they came in a little bit later 
if we were we had a day off before so we we, we let them stay in the hotels um, unless they don't want to but they usually stay in hotels for a little bit longer and then they come in but we had a green room like after show party thing at most shows so that needed to be set up and that was also me setting that up with uh together with my tm and um Sorry, I'm just looking at my notes and I can't read my word. <laughs> right, <laughs> I still can't read it. Never mind. Uh, but yeah, so I, I had to um, I had to set up the green room and make sure it's accessible, and um, we have to get the guests in. And it's just the the it's just very different depending on who you you're working with. Um. So let me walk you through a day as a production coordinator and I'll give you like different examples of stuff. Um, and I think it's probably gonna give you a better idea of what the job is like. Um, it's very early in long days. Um, you have to be aware of that. A lot of days I had to get up at 4.30, five o'clock because um, if you have to drive to the venue, you still have to take some time and you have to be there one hour before load-in, right about. So the first thing I do is um, I allocate the dressing rooms and I put up the signs. A lot of times I get um, dressing room plats in advance. They look like this one. Um, this is a wonderful venue that I love playing in. Um, the, the Spectrum in Oslo. Um, now, of course, once you've been to places, you get some experience in. Like, for example, I know that room one and two have the special, like, luxury showers. So I know I'm going to put my main artists into those rooms because they have, like, this overhead shower thing. Um, <laughs> but um, this is great because you have a very readable plot. You have a lot of rooms. This is just the downstairs area. There is a production office upstairs as well that this plan isn't showing, but this is great when you have, when you need a lot of rooms, because um, especially when you have 125 people, you need a lot of rooms because people need space. They're in the venue all day long. But sometimes you get plans that look like this. This was us doing a show in, I want to say Warsaw. And you look at this plan and you're like, I'm not even sure what's going on here. And this was a very uh, complicated one because there was like, I think there was only a shower in room two and then we had to send our crew and our stagehands to shower all the way across the lot. So I put like, I think I put a total of 30 arrows up that pointed to the shower that day. And I still had to walk people over there a bunch of times and just show them the way. Um, so finding the showers in the morning is a very good topic actually, because um, you want to make sure that the showers are there and accessible in the morning for everybody when they come in. Um, before load-in, a lot of people shower after they load in, but it depends on preference. And I try to have showers ready um, and accessible for people and signs pointing to where they need to go when they come into the venue. Um, usually when I get in, I get in with a TM, sometimes not, depending on what the TM does. Like on, on John Pogarty, the TM doesn't come in that early he doesn't have to on sabaton I, I come in with the tm and then our pm is there and our rigor is there and they look at the stage that time i um look at the way we're gonna a lot of times we look at the at the plans before the show but then when you get to a show then you look at the rooms and you're like oh yeah no this is not gonna work like we laid it out before or it is and sometimes it's super easy and sometimes it's very very difficult especially if you have a big production then you have that you have to downgrade like we did the Rasmatas in Milan. The Rasmatas? We did a show in Milan and that was um, very small for us. It, it, I think it's a three and a half thousand cap. And putting all of our our staff and all of our people into there there is literally three dressing rooms and a production office and that's it in the backstage and the rooms are very very small so you have to walk around we had to have all of our buses parked right outside so people can 
go and use the buses there. And there is a lot of work that goes into days like this because you have to improvise and you have to make sure that everybody's in a good mood and still happy because there it, it can be quite difficult. Um, so one, the next step on my list is uh, after I know where the showers are, I know where my crew can shower, um, I have to distribute the towels. And towels are also something that's quite costly. So you have to make sure that you, you firstly, you have to count everything because you have to make sure you're actually getting what you paid for. Because everything that you're, you're getting, you're getting charged for. So um, then you have to allocate it because you know, you need something special for stage and you need something for the support bands. So you need to make sure everything's where it needs to go. Um, then on Sabaton, for example, we have a washer and dryer with us. Um, so I needed to make sure that at least me or our stage manager knew where the washing machines are going to be put. So then when they get loaded off the truck, they can go straight there and then they can be plugged in and our wardrobe lady can um, start doing what she needs to do. Then as soon as load-in starts and I get my um, office cases, I start prepping the production office. Um, I think most productions run on their own routers now, so you have to make sure that you advance um, a hot wire cable with all the venues. Um, and then you can plug it into your router and then it's great because everybody already has, everybody in the office at least, everybody has um, the Wi-Fi already set up on their phones or their computers. And then you can have a network that your the printer runs on and it just makes things way easier. So you prepare everything, like one of the biggest things on Sabaton because um, my PM loves coffee. One of the biggest things is we, the, the coffee machine that is in our production case needs to be set up. And as soon as it's set up, I make sure I go out and I bring him a cup of coffee and he knows that the machine is running. And I don't do that because I'm a secretary. I do that because I like to do nice things for people. <laughs> um, I also do the same thing. I do, um, I bring our stage manager a cup of tea in the morning, the first thing, just because it makes people's lives so much easier. And that's one of the things I really love about my job is that I, it's kind of my job to check on people's well-being being, and I, really like to make people smile and make people happy. Like I hug everybody in the morning, probably not in this uh, COVID area, but um, after this, I will go back to hugging people in the morning because I, I need that. I need that to start my day. And I think um, it helps a lot of people as well. Um, always treat your stage managers well. Your stage managers are your friends and they will help you a lot. So like uh, my stage manager on John Forgety, he gets um, iced coffee that we have on our office writer. He gets an iced coffee and chia pudding for me in the morning as soon as I get to it. It's just something I love doing and it makes people really happy. Um, so after my office is set up, I print out the day sheets. I put them, I try not to print out too much because I'm trying to be as green as possible, but I at least put, um, Put a day sheet in uh, catering and uh, where the I, I like with John Fogarty. I need to put one where the stagehands are because our stagehands did not have access to our master tour system. I know we've talked about master tour a little bit on um, other webinars before. It's basically a way to organize your entire tour um, that you give all your crew access to, and then they can look at your days, day schedules. They can put in the guest list. They can look at their travel information. Depending on how used to how, how used people are to using Master Tour, you, like on John Fogarty, we still send out day sheets every night uh, when they're ready, so people have a schedule in their email. On Sabaton, we don't do that. Our crew is trained to religiously use Master Tour. Like we don't even send out information before people fly it's all in master tour your confirmation number is going to be on there your flight details are going to be on there it's just going to be like oh yeah it's all on master tour now go check it out and people love using it so it's great and it makes our lives easier as well because it gives you the option of printing guest list out straight which i'm gonna show you some stuff about in a minute as well um one of the biggest parts of my job is dealing with runners. 
runners are people who are hired to help your tour. They're always locals. Um, they're usually hired through the promoter. We all tours I've been on had two. A lot of times you can get by with one, I guess. Um, they will be taking care of picking up the band from hotels if they need that. Taking care of laundry if something needs to be set up for dry cleaning. Um, buying gear if some gear is missing. If you need to buy, I don't know, gaff or some screw that fell out, got lost. One, whoever from, from our tech department comes in and says, I need this and this, I make sure it's reasonable. We always, we don't like wasting money. So like a lot of times we buy stuff in bulk before a tour and maybe people don't know that we have that with us. So just make sure that the request is reasonable and then you send out a runner to buy it. And then you, of course, you can't get everything everywhere. So you need to be wary of that. Some places, sometimes you do a show that's in the middle of nowhere. Sometimes you do a show that's in the middle of a city where everything's accessible. Sometimes you're in Germany, it's a Sunday, and you can, you can pretty much not buy anything because stores are closed here. Um, you need to be aware of these things, and um, you need to organize your runners accordingly. Um, one of the biggest things that I always deal with with runners is um, bus talk. You know, there's always some, well, there should always be some stuff on buses, like basic things like water and beer, but also food and just things that people can snack on. Just the, the happier people are with their food, something that I've learned, <laughs> the better their mood is going to be and the better they're going to work and the smoother your tour is going to run. So, for example, um, in Scandinavia, it's a little bit of an issue now because um, one of the things we always do with John Fogarty, we get a buyout for our catering for each show. So, for example, I don't know, I get like, let's say 200 euros per bus that we have to stock up the bus stock. Now, what it used to be is they give the cash to me, then I settle with the runner, I deal with all the receipts. Um, in Scandinavia, you can't do that anymore because they're not allowed to give you cash. You have to like have very specific reasons to get cash. Um, so instead of what I usually do, I usually look at what's in the buses and what we need and I make sure I, I always check in with everybody before the tour starts and make sure that I know what people's preferences are. Like, do you need, I don't know, lactose free milk on the bus for your coffee or your milk? That's something I have a list of on my computer. So I can, double, I can check that this is something that we had an Australian with us on one tour that drank her coffee with, with cream, which is weird for me, but that's what she liked. So I made sure that she always had, you know, a little container of cream on the bus so she can have her coffee. And that's not, you know, that's not too much to ask. And that's definitely something that um, you can take care of. Um, so this is something that you need to buy. And in Scandinavia, instead of, you know, just sticking to the bare minimum, because you want to make sure you save money still, and you don't want to buy stuff that's going to go off or whatever. In Scandinavia, because, because we couldn't get cash, I would just, you know, buy for the exact amount that I was allowed to have. So I don't know, they would give me 200 euros per bus. So I would buy 200 euros of bus stock every day so we had we had a really happy life oh i mean scandinavia is really expensive but still we had enough so everybody could be very well fed and happy but also you know the amount of bus stock again varies per tour some tours don't buy hard liquor some do some tours don't even provide beer on every day and they only you know throw it as throw it in as a special bonus for days off or whatever so that's, that varies a lot. And, you know, some tours don't buy food. I've, I've been on tours where there was no food in the fridge. There was only drinks or whatever they um, took from the rider <coughs> from um, the show before. Sorry. Um, if you, um, if you have local catering company and this is your setup which is what we had on my last tour 
then you ha you have to buy all the hospitality for the band dressing room as well or for your production office whatever you need i would have to make sure that that's all bought as well and like for example our guys get like i think i want to say we get two bottles of liquor and then one bottle i always make sure it's gin because one of the guys really likes gin but then the other one i like to switch around so they have a variety or sometimes they're like oh can we get this tomorrow and i'm like yeah sure no problem i'll get you this for the next show and then also when you have a green room and you have people over and that is part of your tourist philosophy then you also buy drinks for that so that's also something you need to take care of and that's all stuff that the runners need to buy now in Sabaton, we had um, the situation was that the support bands didn't get a rider because we were taking care of our own rider. Like with John, I don't have catering, so the hospitality gets provided by locals, and then I have to advance the hospitality with a local hospitality person, and I have to make sure everything's there and everything's what we advanced. Um, sometimes a lot of times you'll have to give them alternative products for stuff like make sure that your rider is properly fitted to where you're touring because a lot of articles that american bands want you can't get here because for some reason for whatever reason it is if it's something that's super necessary you know then ask the bands to bring it <coughs> um if you cause, so because on uh, Sabaton we were providing our own hospitality we did the same thing with the supports so the supports were in control of their own money and I'm sure that actually helped them you know make some extra cash on the tour and make sure that they actually buy what they want every night instead of getting the same rider at every single show for over a month but that also meant that I had to deal with uh, sending my runners out to buy their hospitality as well and it was quite complicated because then it's separate separate accounts and separate settlements and sometimes runners get confused so you need to be very very clear about what you want and how you want money to be handled and how you want cash to be ta taken care of cards to be taken care of especially when you're in Scandinavia and you have oh, okay so this card is for this band and this card is for the, this band and then this card is for this band and this list goes to this card and this list goes to this card it's quite confusing and it can be and I can't stress enough how important it is for runners to check in with you when they're not sure about what they're doing and by the way being a runner is a great job to learn about production because you will work very closely with the production coordinator or the production assistant and you will see a lot about their jobs I've had I've had runners that were amazing like you're just like, can I take you on tour and use you every day? And then you have runners that are not so great and you have a lot of issues with. Um, and like I said, you also have to think about um, things like when are the stores open? Are the big stores going to be accessible? Do I need to buy something in bulk? Um, there is a lot of places that have bottle and uh, can deposits now that you pay depending on the country you're in it can be quite excessive in germany can deposits is 25 cents per can doesn't sound like a lot um 40 cans is 10 euros that's money you're literally throwing out so when you think about that and you think about how much you're going through sometimes you have to buy in bulk that was actually one of my funnest moments when I got to buy um, these, I want to say it was 120 crates of beer that we got when we were in Poland. Um, we were lucky enough to have a truck that had a um, heating system in it so we could make sure that these cans don't freeze because we were touring in January. And we could actually buy that in bulk. We also bought a lot of water in bulk. Um, for future tours, I'd like to get further away from buying plastic bottles um, just because it's greener but there is also certain things that you just do on tour because it's practical and it makes people's lives, lives a lot easier so um, yeah I, I was I was super happy when I walked outside and I saw this huge tower of beer just sitting there that was 
probably enough for like a third. This is a lot of beer and that was enough for like a third of the tour or something. It's insane. Like you, when you, when you, you're not used to the numbers, what we go through on big productions is kind of crazy. Um, so one of the biggest things that I do on Sabaton that takes up a lot of time on my, of my day is dealing with guest lists. Um, on John Fogarty, for example, I don't do any of that. The TM takes care of that. Um, with Sabaton, I mostly take care of the guest list. Every now and then I have a question, I double check that with my TM, PM, whatever. Um, sometimes I need to make sure, I need to double check with someone from the crew or whatever, because they put someone on the list with a AAA pass that I don't like to give out, especially when it's laminates, because it's backstage access and they're not limited to shows. So I'll go and double check with them whether this person really needs a pass or can I just give them a sticky for a day. Um, depending on the size of a guest list, it really takes a long time. Um, luckily, we do have master tours, so it's all auto-generated. Um, there is a very, very cool way that I think actually a Will member showed me how to do this. Um, you can put your guest list into an Excel file and then enter that into, have it imported into mail merge in Word, and then you can make really cool envelopes for your guest list, like you can see on the right side of this photo. Um, as you can see, it has the different uh, level of tickets or like the, diff the different kind of tickets in it. So some of these um, have passes in it. You can see on the left is a photo of me during our show in Stockholm, which is also one of our hometown shows, a lot of guests. I think we had a guest list of, I want to say 180 or something like that. And a lot of them had special guest access and we had these special guest uh, laminates made for the tour as well. So all of the special guests got this laminate and all of this has to be sorted through, put together, put in envelopes and it has to be in with a promoter at a certain time so uh, they can bring it to guest list or to the, to the box office, wherever people will pick this up. It's also very important to know what tickets you allocate to people. For example, um, special guests or green room guests, they need to, we need to make sure that they can actually access the room. Like some people need to be on the floor, some people need to be seated, maybe someone's disabled, maybe someone's in a wheelchair. You need to be aware of all of these things. So it's, um, it takes up quite a bit of your time, but it's also fun. Um, and it's, also, it's always good when you have a good relationship with your promoter. If you need to push your ticket numbers a little bit and you have an extra guest, I had to put some special guests in a special extra box at one venue because they had like super status and they needed, they, they could not be seen, but they needed to have a really good seat. So I got a, a promoter who was amazing to open up, like, I think it was the box that usually the follow spot operators are standing in and we could put two people there and that was that was really really cool but you need to have good relationships with people to be able to pull stuff like that off um yeah so then um on a tour where i have to set up a green room then i set up a green room i at the end of the day and the end of the day, depending on how long is dependent on how long the green room lasts, uh, our departure times with Sabaton are usually or usually three o'clock, the latest. So all parties had to stop at three. At that point, you you've been up since seven a.m. So you have long days for sure. I think the longest day I had um, was a festival gig with John Fogarty last year, I want to say it was like 22 hours or something. It was kind of insane. Um, but it is what we do. And when you do something you love, you don't feel it that much. Um, I think that day I also did like 30,000 steps or something. You're just on your feet a lot. Like I, <coughs> I make sure I walk around quite a lot throughout the day and I check in on everybody and I make sure that everybody's okay and everybody has what they need. And, I like to, you know, check, check up on everybody, just be there for people. And I think that's very important to have 
that one person on a tour that does that, even on a big tour like that, where things can get a little bit more anonymous sometimes. Um, at the end of the day, you pack up the dressing room, the, the green room. At that point, usually the trucks are already packed because the trucks are getting packed right after the show. So um, you don't have your office accessible anymore. You have to like make sure that you kind of pack up your office at the last minute possible, but not so you're holding up the loadout. So you always have to make sure you communicate well with your stage vendor, but that's what we have radios for at these big, big shows. Um, yeah, and then at some point, maybe you get a shower and you go to bed and uh, you get on the bus, maybe have a glass of wine. I like to do that. And then uh, you go to bed and then it's the next day. Or maybe it's a day off and or it's four shows in a row and you walk around like a zombie at the end of them. Doing more than three in a row uh, on arenas is not fun. I cannot recommend it. We, I've only, we've only had like one on the last tour. It wasn't too bad, but it was... Um, it's definitely exhausting. Um, one of the things I wanted to show you, just so you have an idea as well, like this is a typical catering advance that you would get if you're not carrying your own catering. So as a production coordinator, as someone who, you know, you could just look at it and be like, oh yeah, whatever, that looks fine. You need to make sure that everybody's, everybody's nutritional needs are met. So if you have vegetarians, you have vegans, you have people that only eat fish, you have people that have allergies to pepper seeds, that's a thing. Um, you just need to make sure that people have something decent to eat. I like to stress when I advance catering that I want healthy options. And I have not, have pe I've not had people complain about that, that yet. Like, um, I think we've reached a point of our lives uh, in, in this world where people actually like to eat healthy food, not like only quinoa every day, but people like to have healthy options and it goes really well. I always want to make sure that um, the vegetarian option is not just a side dish, that it's an actual meal and we make sure that there's enough for non-vegetarians to eat it as well. Like if it's a vegetarian burger, oh, maybe meat eater is going to try that and be like, oh, this is the best thing I've ever eaten. Maybe I can stop eating meat and, you know, make a positive impact on the environment or maybe I can just cut out, uh, cut up down cut down on my meat consumption um or whatever like we may we want to make sure that everybody has um a good experience with their food because like i said it's very important and it has a huge influence on people's touring experience in their days and um i always make sure that there's a variety to the food like if we had chicken for the last two days i'm probably going to go back to the caterer on day three and or the catering that's advanced for the third day and be like, hey, um, can we get something instead of the chicken? Or sometimes you're doing a show somewhere where people are not used to what vegetarian food is. I literally have, in my hospitality writer for John, I have a line saying, if you don't know what a proper vegetarian meal is, please reach out to us. We will give you options. So I actually have a pre-made list of stuff that people can make for vegetarians that is things that are accessible to everybody. Um, Cause you don't want to have people have to live off potatoes for like five days straight. Also has happened before. <laughs> um, the next thing I always do, um, it kind of depends on what your tour is like as well. There is um, always the question of aftershow food. Now, if I'm ordering aftershow food for people, I make sure that um, I get a menu and then people pick out what they want. Um, a lot of times it saves you money as a production because a lot of people will not want to eat at two o'clock in the morning. So then you don't end up ordering an extra pizza for them and people I, I don't know a lot of people that like eating pizza after every show. So I'd like to add some variety to that. And um, it definitely takes extra time out of your day. Like it's probably 20, 30, maybe even more minutes out of my day that 
I'm spending extra making sure that everybody's ordered food or everybody had a look at the menu and they don't want it. When you're on a tour for a longer period of time, people, you know, they get used to <coughs> checking in with you and um, making sure that they have a look at the menus. I always, we, I always put together a group chat on WhatsApp and then I put stuff on like, hey, menus are in the production office on my desk. And then I put a list next to it so people can write down what they want. It's um, a little bit of extra time, especially when you have to translate stuff. Putting stuff into Google Translator is hilarious um, and it will give you very funny entertainment, uh, entertaining result at times. But just, you know, um, it's a little bit of extra time on my hands, but I like to do it to make sure that people actually get food that they like. And then you, it's always really hard still to get it in at a decent time for everybody to eat. But we all do our best and um, when people know that you're doing the best, they're generally okay with, you know, eating cold food every now and then or having to warm it up in the microwave. Um, there's also driver's food that's usually part of the deal that, um, it, it's, it's a good thing. Even if you're on a tour that doesn't do it, it's always a good thing to do because your drivers are working hard and then driving long hours in the middle of the night. So we like to have little bags that we can give them that have some sandwiches packed for them, some water, maybe fruit if they're into that. <laughs> we actually had, um, it was so funny. I was, oh, when, when I started with John, I reworked their hospitality rider so it fits the European market. And there was quite a lot on it and that I needed to change. But somehow I didn't see that there's like, there was a specific food requirement for one of the drivers on there. And I guess I didn't clog on to that it was for one of their drivers on their last tour. So we always had a driver's bag for, I don't know, John. And I was like, after a couple of days, I knew all my driver's names. And I was like, who's John? And they're like, we don't know who John is, but there's a bag with a cheese sandwich for him every day. And I thought it was so funny. Learning people's names is actually a big one. Uh, Cause on days off, you usually check everybody in, or at least you give everybody their hotel keys. That's kind of always been uh, been my role on every tour. I'm I'm horrible with names. I'm good with faces, but I'm horrible with names. So what I've done on the last tour was because I had everybody's passport information because I was getting it all together in advance. Um, I made a cheat sheet for myself of everybody's photos with their names next to them, and I always have a clipboard with me anyway because I walk around checking things off with hospitality or whatever. Um, so I am always checking people in and I have my clipboard, at least in the beginning of a tour. And then I look at, you know, look at the name. I, I know who's on, I, I made the lists for a bus. So I know like, oh, bus one is here. So I only have to look at one bus. So I don't have to like look through all the lists. So it, it made it a little bit, it actually made it a lot easier. And it uh, helped me quickly learn everybody's names, which again is very hard when you have 125 people on a tour or more. So yeah, that's about it. That's kind of all I have. Um, yeah, I, I really enjoy doing what I do. It's um, one of my favorite things about my job is that it's a big part of my job to make everybody smile. Like we, uh, I think I actually wanted to put a slide in here, but I don't think I did. Um, I did, we did, we, on the last tour we did, we had four shows in a row and the last show was also the night of the Super Bowl. We had like, I think we only have two Americans on tour with us, but still, you know, it's the Super Bowl and it's a reason to do something fun. So after four shows in a row, um, I got a bunch of Pizza Hut pizzas and put them, stuck them on the bus and put in some extra beer because we had a long drive to Barcelona that night as well. And I was like, I was like a zombie. I was like half dead in my production office. But I was sitting there and I printed out these tiny footballs and I was sitting in the production office just cutting out these little footballs while the band was on stage. I was, I was exhausted. I was so, so tired. And I was just sitting there like, this is the only thing that's keeping me awake. So I made these like little, I know we call it, like these little strings with all these footballs on them and I put them up in, in all the buses. And it was really nice and people were super happy and people party a lot that night. And luckily we had the next day off and we could actually sleep in. 
but it's stuff like that that for me makes this job so special because you are kind of the good fairy of the job a little bit you you can always be sometimes you have to do like really hard stuff and you have to make you know deal with personnel and it's not always fun and games but it's definitely something i love about it okay olga thanks so much for your presentation that's really amazing um i definitely learned a lot uh, about the role, because I, I didn't really know before, actually. Um, we've had some questions come in, so I'm just going to go back to... How do I get out of screen sharing? I don't know. Do you want me to just stop swearing it? Yeah, just so I can... Um, I don't know, it seems to, to work for me better. Just that. Okay, here we go. So, let's have a look. Um, we've got a question from Natalie. Um, who has asked, uh, so far you've talked about the support acts as being part of the crew, you've given examples of things provided for them, et cetera. Uh, she hasn't worked on an arena tour before and on lower levels, usually the support acts are considered as completely separate from the headliner doing their own advancing travel, et cetera. Is it normal for arena tours to completely include the support act or is this kind of a case to case basis? I think they should always be inclu included. I think it probably depends on the artist. But usually, I mean, when you get to that level, or mostly when you're a support, I think you're mostly advancing through the headliner anyway. Most headliners prefer it. And then there's no confusion about stage times and whatnot, dressing rooms, whatever you get or what you don't get. Um, it's much easier when you advance through the headliner. Some Maybe some don't like doing that, but most tours, that's how it's run, especially on a bigger level. And I would really hope that most bigger bands treat the support as part of their, you know, part of their problem. I don't want to say it's a problem, but uh, you know what I mean. Um, the kinder you treat your support bands, you know, the better experience they're going to have and the easier it's going to be to live together for a month or how long you're together. And then you never know, like I know a bunch of stories of bands having support bands on in one year and then the support band really blows up and next year they're the headliner and you're supporting them. So you never know. And then you, you don't want to treat them like shit and then you end up supporting them because management put you on and then you were the person being an asshole to them. That, it's just going to come around and bite you in the ass. And even if it doesn't, I just, being an asshole is never a good thing. <laughs> so it, yeah. it's always, it's always better when you, when you include people. I totally agree. Especially from, I guess the only perspective I know is the tech perspective. Um, when the headliner just doesn't want to accommodate you tech wise, it can be really frustrating when, you know, they just refuse to kind of uh, work work together basically it's really annoying so I agree with you completely on it's, that it's hard sometimes because it really depends on what you can do like sometimes you just can't accommodate some wishes of the support and sometimes the support doesn't understand why and that's fine too but sometimes it's just impossible but I don't think you should ever say no to someone just to say no the best example I have was um, on the funny enough on the first show of the Sabaton tour that I was just on the first show was in November, but the rest of the tour was January this year. It was really confusing, but we did like one show was split off in November, um, the first one in Helsinki. And I was on tour with Amaranth on, at that point, and I was doing merch for Amaranth. And that was during the postal strike in Finland. So we were in Helsinki and we were going to Norway and I had all this merch that was still in our trailer that we couldn't take to Norway because you can't, importing merch in, to Norway is super complicated and you just, if you can, if you can avoid it, don't do it. It's, it's, it's a huge pain in the ass. Um, so the merch company was like, oh yeah, just leave the merch there and we're going to pick it up. The lady that works at the arena, I, thought, I think I saw her like four times last year. So she was absolutely cool with it. But then there was a postal strike. And a ferry strike that came along with it because they were supporting the post. And I didn't know whether merch could go out at all. And I needed it like a couple of days later so we could pick it up because I needed it for the rest of the tour when we leave Norway. So I went to Sabaton's production manager 
And I asked him whether it was possible for them to take the merch with us, with them on one of their trucks. It wasn't a lot. It was like, I don't know, 10 boxes or whatever. And I was, I felt horrible. I like, I really didn't want to ask him because I was like, I'm being so rude. I'm with the, I'm not even with the main support. I'm with the opening band and I'm going to the PM and I'm making his day worse, more difficult or whatever. And I was like, uh, I have a really like, like a really rude question or whatever. And it was like, uh, I really don't want to inconvenience it, but is that, is it possible? And he was like, yeah, of course, no problem. As long as it's the merch is down by the truck, by the time the truck is packed, why would we not take it? And I was like, I was super grateful for that. And I think that's an amazing way to treat your opening band, even though that was, you know, he was doing me a huge favor and we, it, we saved money that way because we didn't have to get it shipped, but also because the situation was quite complicated that made sure that we could, you know, get to our merchant time. Cause all we had to do was pick it up from their lockup. And then because I, of that, um, me communicating with him and me then later thanking him for helping us out, he ended up reaching out to me and giving me this job. So you never know where things come from in this industry. Yeah, that's really good advice. Um, we have a question from Siggy who has uh, said she'd love to hear your thoughts on Crew After Show and how you run it in your camp. Uh, you did mention a little bit um, about how you set up your green room and everything, but do you want to elaborate a little bit more on that process? Yeah, sure thing. Um, I mean, it depends on what your artist wants and what your artist wants to spend on After Show food. I, I hate tours where you get pizza at the end. I hate it. I like, I'd like to at least give people a little bit of a choice. Um, sometimes you don't have the option of, I don't know, checking in with everybody. Like I, I, I talked quite a bit about um, what I do on John Fogarty, for example, where I put out a list on my desk and everybody comes in and puts whatever they want in the list. And then I give the list to um, the runner or the local promoter and they order it from whatever place they recommend. But it's usually what you get. You get a menu or something off the promoter. They do it so often. So they have menus for the places that um, they order from frequently because the issue with after show is you want to get it as late as possible so it's still warm. Um, sometimes when you, like in Russia, for example, sometimes the places that promoter recommended was, uh, were not great. And I ended up, asking some of my Russian friends, like, where can I order food online? So I have alternatives as well. And you can look stuff up on Uber Eats where it's available if you can find what you want through the promoter. But I always want to make sure that people have an option of something like a salad or a chicken breast or whatever, just something that's not covered in loads of dough and cheese that is really not good for you to eat at two o'clock in the morning. I know you like people work really hard and I think people should be provided food every five hours at least. So like uh, some tourists don't do after show food, then at least make sure that there's loads of food on the bus so they can make themselves a sandwich or whatever. Like we have, we have a very holy sandwich maker on the Sabbath on Sabaton. Like the sandwich maker is the center of the bus universe. It's so important. We lost a screw out of it. On the last tour and I had my runners check at like 15 different hardware stores to get us that screw so the, the sandwich maker could work properly again. I thought when you said sandwich maker, I thought you meant you hired someone to, to be the sandwich <laughs> maker. Sorry. That's the next step. I was step. laughing. Yeah. That's the next step. It's an important job. <laughs> that would probably fall on me again. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Um, so we have a question from Adriana. She's from Greece and she says the last two and a half years, she's been a production coordinator for local venue and local arenas. Uh, any suggestions for production coordinator job opportunities uh, in UK or Europe? So maybe I know you kind of just got into it. I mean, you didn't apply for it. Well, you did apply for a job, actually, I guess. Um, but do you have any um I guess, advice for how to find these jobs other than Bobnet. <laughs> Not everybody is very lucky in Bobnet. I have to point that out. Um, I think most people are, a lot of people are signed up to Bobnet, Bobnet and don't get a lot of work from it. And it's more American based as well. Um, I think if you're looking for positions in the UK, 
there. Um, I mean, obviously, Women in Life Music is a great group. Like Facebook groups are good are a good resource. There's a UK touring crew group that's sometimes decent. Sometimes it's a lot of angry men, but um, but jobs get posted there. I think, especially if you work at venues, the best thing is to, you know, really look for people that you connect with when they go through your venue. Like when you when you really get along with a production manager or a tour manager or whoever is on tour and you really get along with these people sometimes you just don't click with someone but sometimes you do and you feel like friends you know like I have that in a lot of places and a lot of venues I come in and maybe there it's like it's not even the main promoter but it's the promoter assistant and I'm so happy to see them like um one of the biggest promoters in Italy I know if I need something I can text him and he will get it done. Like he is amazing. There is no doubts about it. And this is, you know, relationships you built with, uh, from his side of view, uh, his point of view, he builds this relationship with people coming through. So if I needed someone to do his job on a tour, it's quite likely that I would reach out to him and bring him on tour. Cause I know he's awesome every single time when I come in and I do stuff locally. And if you connect with these people, make sure you stay in touch, like make sure you get the contact, make sure if you were on email with someone before, make sure you send a follow-up email. Like literally me sending an email to the headliners PM saying, hey, thank you so much for helping us out. Thank you so much for, you know, making our life easier. That ended up getting me a job along with other factors, obviously, but it's really important. And I think one of the most important things is building good relationships with people. Yeah, I totally agree. And and being someone who does that job in an arena, you're in perfect position to to create all these uh, relationships. Um, so we have another question from Adrian. He says, "Do you have a say in choosing runners, or are they all provided by promoters?" They're usually provided by promoters. I um, I was on a random Q and A the other day with someone who books runners in Madrid. And I instantly reached out to her and I was like, can I please get your contact for the next time I'm, I'm in Madrid? Because a lot of times we get people in Spain that don't speak English. Mm. It's an issue when you tour Spain. I've tried doing my Duolingo, but I'm more focused on Swedish right now. <laughs> but um, if I have someone and I know they're good, like I have a great runner in Berlin, so I can say to the promoter, hey, can you please book this guy? I know you work with him or I know he's really great. Sometimes it works like that, but usually runners are always booked through the promoter unless you have a special request or whatever. Okay. And how does one become a runner? Maybe if someone who's interested in becoming a production coordinator, maybe running is a good way to get in. How do you become a runner? Running is a really, really great way to get into any touring job, really, because you get to see a lot of the facets of um, touring. Um, I work, for example, when I'm off tour, which hasn't happened a lot lately, but when I'm home, I work as a stagehand and the company I work for also provides runners. So every now and then they also book me as a runner. I was the runner for Robin when they did the show here um, last year in April, I want to say. Um, I was re very bored because all I did, I think all day was take one guy to the swimming pool and then come back. And I think that was exactly, oh no, I did pick Robin up from the train station. That was kind of cool, but that's about what I got to do. But sometimes, you know, when you're, especially when you're the shopping runner and you're running around and you're buying all of these things, it's a really cool job. Um, for most companies I know it's booked through like a stagehand company or whatever. If it's not then you could always reach out to promoters directly and say, hey, I'm really interested in doing this. How can I apply? Yeah, that's really good advice. Um, we've got another question from Neve. I hope I pronounced your name right. Um, saying, how essential would you consider qualifications for this role and getting experience in that role? I mean... I wouldn't say that I have any special qualifications to do the job besides being good at excellent at math. Um, I speak four languages that helps a lot. Definitely. Um, yeah. Speaking languages and being good in English because English is still the 
language of the touring world. And I think it's always going to be. Um, that's always important. Um, there are some really good Excel courses that you can take. Like Excel is your best friend. It's the best thing ever. So the more Excel skills that you have, um, the better. But everything else is just kind of people skills. Like there is not one specific thing that you need to learn. And experience is difficult. It's difficult to get experience, especially in a position like this. Like there is, this is a role that only happens in very advanced touring. Like in big productions have someone, an extra person taking care of all the backstage and all of the flow behind the stage cause the TM and the PM cannot take care of that anymore because it's just too much work. So I, th I think what's, just, what's very important is experience in some form of touring. Like you can't, your first tour is not going to be a PA or a production coordinator. It's just not because you, you won't know how a tour works. Like a tour is like a living organism and you need to understand that. Even though every single one of them is different, you need to understand what life on the road is like. So get in whatever experience you want or whatever you can do. Like if you go into lighting, because like I find lighting absolutely fascinating. I think it's beautiful. And I really want to learn more about it. And I've been watching webinars and tutorials and stuff. Um, so if you, you're interested in that or that's something you do, but you really find the administrative side of things interesting, that's, you know, something you can do. Like just try to be around the production people a little bit more but you definitely have to tour first. Yeah, I agree. Um, so that's it for questions in the chat. Um, I'm gonna like round this up by just asking the question that I like to ask everyone who does these webinars, which is how are you handling this current situation? Um, do you have any kind of advice uh, for people? Maybe you have some like learning materials. I know you mentioned uh, tour, one, tour Management 101, which yeah. we, I've been talking about almost every webinar because it's just brilliant. But so um, yeah, how, how are you doing in, in this climate? Are you kind of surviving? Are you thriving? Um, I would definitely wouldn't say thriving. Um, I'm, I know how much I love my job. Like, I love being on tour and it's just my favorite thing in the world. So it's been tough. It's not been easy for sure. And it's kind of like, it comes and goes. I, it reminds me of the Corona waves a little bit as well. My mood, you know, it goes up and down. I try to do a lot of exercise. I try to learn things and like get new habits that I don't have usually that are going to be healthy. And like, I try, I'm trying to get myself into running. I hate running. I still don't like it two months in, but, um, it's something I can do while I'm on tour as well. And that's kind of why I've been pushing myself to do it. I've been doing loads and loads of webinars. Tour Management 101 is amazing. Um, there's some great people on there that I've worked with. My, my production manager that um, I do John Forgety with was on last week, I think. So there's some, some really great people on there. Um, webinars are great. I have an Excel course that it's like a basic course or something, but I still want to take it. I've um, started um, the education to become a counselor, which wow. is something um, it's something that I always wanted to do for touring as well. Cause my role kind of binds into that, I guess. And I want to be, I always say I want to be the person that everybody can come to with whatever issue they have. And I think that's definitely going to help me. And it might be something that helps with my CV as well, that I know, like I can say, Hey, I have a counseling degree and I can actually help people out if they have issues on the road or off the road. Maybe it's not going to do anything, but it's something I've been meaning to do for a long time. So now I finally have the time to do it. Um, yeah. And it just, I check in with, with my colleagues a lot. Like there's people I text once a week or once every couple of weeks, there's people I talk to every day. I have a couple of quarantine buddies. So like a couple of people that kind of make sure I don't get too down and I make sure that they don't get too down. This is, there's days where you just feel like the world's destroying you right now. But I'm trying to stay positive. I currently have some tours booked for the fall. 
are they going to happen? I don't know. Everybody I've talked to who's on the promoter side of things is like, this year's done, this year's a write-off, forget about it. I have an all German arena tour booked for October. Is it going to happen? I don't know. I think it might, it might be. I mean, right now we have like 5,000 cases left in Germany. So I'm trying to stay positive and stay hopeful. And when we get to that kind of fall point and we see that things are really going to shit again, then I'll deal with it then. And then I guess I'll look for some form of normal work. But right now I'm just surviving and kind of taking some time off. Like we're allowed to travel again and I might go to Sweden in a week or so and see some people I usually, you know, I usually tour with and I'm supposed to be, I was supposed to be working with this summer and spend some normal human time with them and see what that's like. Yeah, I think we all need a bit of normal human time, um, I guess. But it's great to hear that you're, you know, you're not kind of giving up and you're still learning and stuff. Um, I, I really like the to hear that you're doing the counseling course. That's, I think that is going to be an important thing uh, in the future when it comes to touring, because there's so much discussion now about uh, mental health and being a mental health first aider, um, that I think, yeah, is definitely going to be an asset uh, to you as a touring person. I think so too. And I think, um, especially in these times, like if this really goes on for quite some time longer, then, it will also, you know, make it possible for me to start counseling people that are struggling with these times right now. And, you know, it will give me the means to help people, which I always have loved doing, which is why I love this job so much. And yeah, I think, I think it's, it's definitely, it's something I've been talking about for a while that I wanted to do and now I can. And I should. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. Uh, thank you so much for, um, all of your expertise and answering all these questions and everything. It was, it was really inspiring. Um, Thank you for having me. It's great. No, it's been a pleasure. I, I told you I like talking about my work. So. It's great. No, thank, thanks so much for doing this. Um, we, as I said, are nearly coming to the end of these, but we do have a couple more webinars lined up. Uh, we have one next week with Sarah Ferrero. Um, she's backline tech for Will Young, Craig David, Westlife, and that's gonna be really cool. So don't miss that one if you're interested in Backline. And then not the week after, because she's actually working, but we have uh, another German lady called Miriam, who's a rigger, who is gonna be doing a presentation all about rigging, but I'm not quite awesome. sure on the date yet, because she's so busy and I'm really jealous. But um, yeah, just stay in touch and uh, I hope to see you on uh, the next one. Thanks again. Bye. Bye, everyone.